Hi, this is Zoe, and today we're talking about failure. Not just the euphemisms we've already heard, such as failure is just feedback and carry on. I'm talking about real failure. What do we actually do when we hit that confronting devastation? And it's one thing that most people are afraid of. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Zoe Ralph Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. Hey, welcome back. First of all, I'm sounding a little bit uh, snotty and grotty. It's because I came back from Tasmania with a cold. Thank you very much. (laughs) So I am a bit croaky, but maybe it'll add to my sultry tones a little bit. Speaking of Tasmania, it was the fabulous start to the Leaders Edge Mastermind, the second group to commence this 12-month odyssey, and we had a blast. It was a small, intimate group. The scenery was spectacular. The weather was fairly kind, including the most amazing boat ride in epic waves, hence the group has named themselves Wave Riders, and also because the metaphoric connotations, of course. Uh, Lovely time, beautiful pictures. You can check it out on Facebook. I posted every day some of the glorious views that we had. Perfect for setting us up for big picture thinking and really getting grounded. So there was a strong commitment from each member of the group to get outside and really soak up the atmosphere of the outdoors because it's a really good stabilizer. So I encourage you to do the same. So now that Tasmania is out of the way, we are looking forward to a couple of things. One is the Edge of Leadership Unconference. It is about five weeks away. (laughs) So excited for this. Our focus is on uh, employee engagement and the what we can do to build successful employee experience so that our staff stay loyal. And loyalty doesn't mean just sticking around. It means becoming lifelong advocates. And every leader I know wants to be a great leader. And the people that you're going to meet and the speakers you're going to hear at this event will show you how to do just that. So you can get more information at edgeofleadership.com.au. And uh, yeah, tickets are still on early bird. So it's a good thing to come along, bring your team along too. It's going to be a fun fabulous day in a beautiful environment. So we've picked a great setting with beautiful views as well. Can you see a theme here? Beautiful views and outdoor spaces. (laughs) It's the way I like to roll, baby. And the other big piece of news, I just got the cover of Loyalty back from the designer. Yay! (laughs) Yeah, my third book, Loyalty, uh, which is Stop Staff Turnover, Boost Engagement, and Create Lifelong Advocates is coming out by the end of March as well. So that little baby is coming into being fairly shortly. So we'll be posting the um, where you can get access pre, pre-purchase pre orders where I will sign it personally with a little love note and personally put it into its little satchel and send it on its way to you if you pre-order. So we'll get that set up in the next week or so and you'll get a, a chance to see the cover on Facebook and LinkedIn Um, so excited for this book. Every client I'm talking to lately needs this book. So it's perfect timing as far as I'm concerned. So with all these successes, it's now time to talk about failure. Dun, dun, dun. In my, with my coaching clients, one of the questions I ask is, and when they start working with me, it's what's the one thing you're most afraid of? And quite often, and I'm surprised by how often this is, they speak to failure. They choose failure as the thing that they're most afraid of. And failure can mean all sorts of different things to different people. Largely, it means not fulfilling what you intended to do or letting people down in some way, shape, or form. So I wanted to actually really address this because I think it has been glossed over with Uh, optimistic, euphemistic views of what failure is. And I'll give you some classic examples. And it's meant to be encouraging and inspiring. And yet, I don't think it really deals with what we face when we have a significant failure. So here's a couple examples of the the euphemistic, optimistic view of failure, from failure to triumph. And these are classic examples. The first one is Steve Jobs. And it is a great story, right? So he started Apple with Steve Wozniak, uh, two men in a garage. That was their story. And it's been built into a $2 billion company with 4,000 employees worldwide, just making squads of money. 
and uh, producing pretty good products generally, though, you know, there's plenty to criticize um, as well. So his story, Steve Jobs' story was, he was actually fired from the very company he began. And the documentaries I've seen, this is quite amazing. You know, how does a brilliant genius set up a remarkable company and get ousted from the thing he set up? I mean, talk about failure. (laughs) That's pretty humiliating. And what he did next was quite interesting. He founded up, well, ironically, a company called Next, and then Pixar, which was, um, is, have, Pixar in particular has gone on to be a very successful um, movie company. So from there, that's sort of what set the ground rolling to invite him back into Apple. So he got rehired at Apple. So from failure, embarrassment, and mortification back to triumph. And what Jobs said about this in 2005, he said, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever have happened to me. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) And that's the quintessential failure to triumph story. You know, it was, it sucked at the time, but it turned out to be fantastic. And I've even used that, that um, model to explain how I got over cancer and how it's been a really wonderful thing for me in the end. And it doesn't feel so at the time. So here's another example for you in traditional stories, Albert Einstein. I didn't know this about Albert Einstein. He could not speak fluently until the age of nine. Nine. So you can imagine, you thought, if your kid doesn't speak well until the age of nine, you're thinking you've got a kid with some serious challenges. Well, we all know that he turned out a little bit better than a kid with serious challenges. He was also expelled from school because he was a bit of a rebel, and he, um, he was refused admittance to the Zurich Polytechnic School. So this is one of our modern-day geniuses, Albert Einstein. So a failure, couldn't speak properly, was expelled from school, and couldn't get into the Polytechnic School. So there's hope for all of us young uh, radicals, <laughs> after all. And here's my third example. Stephen King. Now, this one was a bit disturbing, actually, when I read about him. So he was a paranoid, troubled child. You know, this is Stephen King, the guy who wrote all the scary books and which went into become very successful movies. So he was a paranoid, troubled kid, had lots of nightmares, raised in poverty, and he grew up to the title to be the master of horror. Like some, I can't even watch his movies. I just find them too scary. He became addicted to drugs and alcohol, and that's how he coped with his unhappiness that he felt in his life. He got multiple rejections by publishers, and which led him to take more and more drugs, and even caused him to consider violence towards his own kids. So he had this propensity for violence and abuse. And what he did is he channeled all those intense emotions into his writing. So that makes him even scarier. So all that stuff that comes out in his books is from a disturbed mind. (laughs) Yeah, scary. And we all know how successful he's been. So the failure of inner torment into turning your disability into your um, ability is the Stephen King example. So these are some examples. Oh, there goes my phone, which I keep forgetting to unplug when I do recording. Sorry about that. Uh, Here's one more. Pretty famous one, J.K. Rowling, author of the stupendously, ridiculously successful Harry Potter series. And her story of failure is that she got married, was very briefly married, divorced pretty quickly, left to be a single uh, single mom, unemployed, living on uh, very little cash and scribbling her way through Harry Potter to cope. And well, we all know how that turned out, turned out pretty well. So when she was unemployed and, and the lone parent scribbling away in a cafe, she felt like a complete failure, failure in her marriage, failure as a parent, failure as a, as a worker, and so on. And she likes to tell the story about, about her origins because she's, she thinks it's important to recognize from failure comes important things. All right, so enough of the rah-rah story. Let's talk about real, plain, genuine failure. And here are some examples. In 1912, Captain Edward Smith crashes the Titanic into an iceberg. You might remember that story <laughs> or know of the story. Um, it's not a funny story, really. It's, it was meant to be the unsinkable ship. So, yeah, be mindful of what you call your products. So the passenger liner, the Titanic, 
was on its maiden voyage, its first trip to England, from England, sorry, to the U.S. in 1912. And they ran it into an iceberg. 1,517 people died. And I think they rescued maybe 866. So the money lost at the time was $7.5 million in shipbuilding costs and adjusted for inflation, $168 million. Well, that's kind of like a pretty big failure, I reckon. Like, that's pretty horrendous. You lose your ship, you lose your reputation. I reckon that ship company went out of, went out of business. And the captain, well, he, he died, so he, um, his failure was pretty big. At least he didn't have to live with the shame of having uh, sunk the unsinkable ship. Here's another one. <coughs> Excuse me again. This one is, uh, when was this? 1999. NASA uses the metric system while Lockheed Martin uses the English system when building a satellite. Hmm, what could go wrong? <laughs> well, what went wrong is uh, because they were using two different measurement systems, it prevented the spacecraft's navigation coordinates from being transferred from a spacecraft team in Denver to a lab in California. The orbiter was lost in space. Dun dun. And uh, NASA lost $125 million. And if you adjust inflation, $165 million. <laughs> I think that's, I found that pretty funny, actually, because, well, it's sad, it's, it's sad and ridiculous, isn't it? Like, it's such a fundamental thing. Which measurement system are you using? English system or metric? Hello, hello. And uh, it's kind of a, a big assumption, isn't it? And that sort of speaks to the uh, the tragedy or the challenges of, of assumptions is that they can, they can cost a lot of money. So that's a pretty substantive failure. All right, here's my third example. 1990, 1994. Safety inspectors for, forget to replace a valve at the Piper Bravo oil rig. Now this is pretty devastating. So some oil, vac, oil workers were evacuated after an explosion. Uh, the explosion killed 167 of the 226 men working. 167 people died. So the story is, the inspectors removed and replaced all the safety valves, ooh, except for one, which was never put back. And unaware the safety valve was missing, a worker pushed the start button and gas began to leak out. It explodes and it kills pretty much almost everybody. So apart from killing people, that's $3.4 billion in repairs. Um, and that's 1994 prices. That's 5.1 billion in today's prices. One valve, 5.1 billion, and 167 people died. I would count that as a pretty massive, colossal failure. Hard to spin that into a positive state of, don't worry, it can be optimistic and fabulous. The reality is, you have an incident like that, and if you're responsible and alive to talk about it afterwards, likely you're going to experience a big bucket of shame, regret, remorse, guilt, pretty much all the bottom of the barrel human emotions you could possibly name to sit crippled with the knowledge that you wrecked your company, killed people, and so on, just because of a lapse of focus or a mistake or not following procedure or an assumption. That's a pretty big, devastating thing, isn't it? To sit with that. And I think Brene Brown and her work, she does a pretty good job of talking about shame and how crippling it can be. And uh, she talks about it less in terms of failure. She talks it more about the, the, the little things where we tell ourselves terrible stories and we feel shame. And she says things like, shame is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. Um, here's another quote from her. Shame, blame, disrespect, betrayal, and the withholding of affection damage the roots from which love grows. Love can only survive these injuries if they are acknowledged, healed, and rare. Uh, and here's another one. Shame corrodes the very part of us that believes we are capable of change. So she's talking about in the context of feeling small. So in our day-to-day -day lives, when we, we let the little mistakes that we make cripple us, and I don't think she's necessarily talking about these big, devastating failures. And this is what leaders fear, I think, when they're talking about failure. Like, they're talking about big, horny failure, where 
your business is crippled, you lose your home, people suffer, not even like devastating stuff like this, the ones examples I just gave, which are gargantuan and over the top and not really something everybody faces every day, but that's pretty serious. Devastating loss of, of your business and so on can be, that can face us, we can feel devastation and shame and guilt, etc. So the question I want to know, and I've been exploring is if you face one of these failures, how do you work your way out of that pit? Because it does feel like a pit, like shame is a very heavy uh, emotion. It's one of the most negative emotions we can, I think it is the most negative emotion. And if you look at the book, um, Power Versus Force by Dale, Dave Hawkins, I think I got the, the name wrong. However, I will list it in the show notes, which you will find, by the way, at zoerouth.com slash podcast slash failure. <laughs> I will list the references there. Uh, so you can have a look at that book. Um, when you do have a look at that, basically list it a sort of a gradient of positive to negative emotions. And shame is rock bottom. Like it doesn't get much worse than that. So how do we get out of that? Like the fact is, if you take, for example, the oil rig story, if you're the inspector that left off the cap, I reckon you feel pretty miserable about yourself at that point. You know, it's kind of like, whoopsie, (laughs) what do you do? You know, people are dead. A business is devastated. It has massive repercussions all because you forgot to put a valve back on. Right. So sitting with this, I think what we need to do as leaders is if that's your experience, if you have something as horrendous as that, or even that feels as horrendous as that, where you sit in that same sort of feeling of shame, you really need to stare down that feeling. You really need to sort of sit with it, confront it, not try and ignore it, not try and hide from it, just be with it because it is black and it is terrible. And once you do that, and once you realize and name it, name that you have shame and that you feel guilty and you feel responsible, just experience those emotions fully. And then you need to move through that. And how you do that is that you accept that this event happened. No amount of regret or guilt is going to stop it from ever happening or um, erase what has happened. So you need to basically accept that it happened. This thing happened. It was horrendous. And then that's sort of like a tiny baby step of movement. It doesn't even feel like forward. It just feels like, right, you're just confronting it. You're staring it down. Then it's committing to learning from it. That's the kind of the biggest piece really of what we can do when we're experiencing something like this. This was horrendous. What can I do to learn from this so that I don't feel completely devastated and distraught by these feelings of shame? And I think this is um, acceptance, acceptance and commitment therapy is based on this premise, accept that it happened and commit to doing something. So the commitment here is commit to learning, commit to applying and commit to sharing what you've learned. Those three things can help us make something useful of a devastation. Doesn't deny the devastation, doesn't excuse our participation in it, whatever that means. If we can, the next step is to move towards making amends. Some things you just, you cannot make amends. You know, those people lost their lives in that oil rig or on the Titanic. Like, how do you make amends to hundreds of people like that? Well, one person cannot do, but you can turn your life into a life of service, uh, one of contribution, even though there was devastation. At some point, at some point, you're going to have to forgive yourself doesn't mean condone what's happened, but it means that you release yourself from living a life of torment, torment forevermore. Because that's, I think, what a lot of people hang on to, you know, it's if, if I feel good at any point after such a devastating loss, does that mean I haven't learned or that I've, um, they feel like they should be punished forever. And that's not necessarily the case. You can forgive yourself if you accept, commit, learn, and apply what you've learned to make something useful of it. So forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is deciding that the past will not drive your future uh, with an anchor. Like it's like moving forward with this thing dragging behind you. 
So we need, if we're going to make something productive and useful for with our lives, is to confront all these things and to forgive ourselves by giving ourselves permission to be of use again, to be of constructive, healthy, and happy in our contributions. So there you have it. I think there is much to learn from our failures. And I think if we have a greater relationship with our failures, we will be able to take risks better. Another at the other end of the spectrum is when we make mistakes and we deal with pretty confronting failure, how we can move through that and make something constructive and useful with the incident and with our lives, regardless of what's happened in the incident. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, actually. Like, um, I'm, I don't want to gloss over failure and to, like, to treat it as an opportunity just to spin and be positive. I think it's something that we really do need to confront and deal with as leaders. Some failures are absolutely real and genuine and have really huge consequences. And how we deal with them, how we process them, how we make use of them amplifies, amplifies, <laughs> exemplifies who we are as leaders, what we are truly made of. So in the meantime, live well, lead well. <laughs>